Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Steve Ferguson, and we're pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope that you will find the next hour or so useful and informative. We've developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First, I hope you can see the title slide on your computer. A few housekeeping items. First, the attendee sound is muted to prevent audio interruptions during the event. A recording of this event is underway and will be distributed to all attendees, all registered uh, people uh, after the event and uh, along with the presentation itself. So the recording and the presentation will be sent to you within the next day or two. We welcome your comments. The chat function is available, or you can use the Q&A either as part of the WebEx tools, or you can email Willie at WLL.com with your mailing address. You might want to select a full screen view to better your uh, presentation viewing. And again, the chat comments, you can select the chat function down in the WebEx tools down in the lower left corner of your screen. We are available to be contacted at Washington Labs at WLL.com through the Academy, Academy at WLL.com. Or if you want to contact Bruce Archambault directly, our speaker today, you have his uh, contact information available here. I'd like to present our speaker. Dr. Bruce Archambault is an IBM Distinguished Engineer, meet you as an IBM RTP, Research Triangle Park, and an adjunct professor at Missouri University, Rural Missouri. He received his BSEE from the University of New Hampshire in 1977 and his MSEE from Northwestern in 1981. He received his PhD from the University of New Hampshire in 1997. His doctoral research was in the area of computational electromagnetics applied to real world EMC problems. He held positions at Digital Equipment Corporation and Seth Corporation, supporting product design and EM analysis. In 1997, he joined IBM in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he is the lead EMC engineer responsible for EMC tool development and use on a variety of products. Bruce has authored or co-authored a number of papers in computational electromagnetics, mostly applied to real-world EMC applications. He is currently a member of the board of directors for the IEEE EMC Society. He is the author of the book, PCB Design for Real-World EMI Control, and lead author of the book, EMC Computation Model Hand Modeling Handbook. He has lectured at the University of Oxford for the past 13 years. Please let us welcome Bruce to our presentation. Bruce, I'm going to give you the tool to be able to uh, do your presentation. You should be okay. able to share your screen presently. Okay, I'm trying to share the screen. And I'll let you know when it is visible. Well, right now I'm seeing a blank. Is that yeah, me, me too. <laughs> Usually I get a thing at the top of the screen saying I'm, I'm sharing the screen. Yes, Here it comes. Can you uh, could go up to the uh, tool at the top and select share screen just to see if it is? It's coming now. Here we go. There. Thank you. Well, things are slow today. Well, it is Wednesday. That must be it. 
Okay, can you see my uh, slides? Uh, it is very good, and your audio is very good. Thanks, okay. Bruce. Welcome. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Steve. So, <clears throat> one of the, the things we're going to talk about today is electromagnetics. Um, and, you know, most of us have had the experience of uh, going to a university where we studied electromagnetics. And uh, if you're anything like me, after my first electromagnetics class, um, I wiped the sweat off my forehead and said, thank God that's over. I'm never doing that again. Somehow or other, I ended up specializing in electromagnetics, and I'm not sure how that ended up happening. I think there must have been a fair amount of beer involved in that decision. But uh, here I am. But uh, it's taken me a long time to kind of understand um, what electromagnetics really means without having to get into the messy math. And so, so that's the, the plan for today, is to uh, not deal with the... Um, the messy math. For some reason, I can't seem to forward my slide here. Uh. Okay, here we go. Is this working now? There we go. All right, sorry about that. My computer, I just upgraded to a new version of um, Microsoft Office, and uh, it's uh, not cooperating. So I think that, uh, you know, the missing math has its place, and certainly um, university professors are very good at it. In fact, um, you know, I, my experience was that uh, there's always at least one guy in the class of electromagnetics that uh, does really, really well with the messy math. and. Uh, um, you know, the rest of us hated him because the rest of us are struggling to get through the math. And and then um, when all is said and done, we all go off and get a job. The guy who was really good with the messy math doesn't find anybody who wants to hire him to do that job. And so he ends up being a professor. And so he's going to teach electromagnetics, and of course he's going to teach it with the math that he loves and is so good at. So it's kind of like a you know never ending um, never ending thing that's going to keep on being the same way. But I don't think that we need to understand, we don't need the math to understand electromagnetics. And so we're going to minimize the math here, just kind of talk a little bit about what is the meaning of some of these things that we get into. And then we'll get into the, the more physics here of, of Maxwell's equations and Faraday's law, again, without the, the messy math. But I think it's worth looking at what the meaning of derivative and integration is a little bit um, as we're going along the way. So the derivative, you know, when I was studying um, ca uh, calculus at the university, I learned that the derivative of x squared was 2x. And you know why? No, I have no idea. It just because that's it, you know. Uh, that's what we had to know to do the homework and do the test, right? But um, really there's a meaning to the derivative, and it's really how fast is something changing. This something can be almost anything. It could be changing with respect to time. If you put the, uh, the dt in the bottom of it, or position, if you put a dx there, x meaning the position, and this could be, this something here could be really anything that you want to see how fast something's changing. So, you know, it might be how fast is Bruce losing his hair, you know, uh, with respect to time. And the answer to that, by the way, is way too fast, although it's slowed down quite a bit since I've lost most of my hair now. So, but, but that's just an indication. It could be how fast is the car going, how fast is the electric field changing, how fast is the current changing on a circuit. could be anything. Um, that's all that this derivative means. Now, the mathematicians are never happy with something simple, and so you might have this something changing with more than one thing. Um, might be changing with respect to both time and position. And so if you wanted to see how fast something is changing with respect to time, you would hold x to position as a constant, and then just see how fast it's changing with respect to time. Or conversely, you might hold time constant and just see how fast something is changing with respect to position. So that's all that this kind of, um, you know, cute little symbol here means, this uh, Greek symbol, the derivative, when you see that, it just means that whatever you're taking the derivative of is changing with more than just one thing. And you're going to hold everything constant with respect to something as you look to see how fast it's changing with respect to something else. <clears throat> now, a good example maybe of... Um, uh, of a um, looking at a change in position might be, let's just say we have a power ground plane pair on a circuit board, and uh, you know if the circuit board isn't decoupled properly, 
uh, depending on the physical size of the circuit board, we could actually excite the resonances as this upper picture shows. And we'll have standing waves. And as an EMC engineer, knowing that I've got these really high area, these red areas along the edge of the printed circuit board, would be very alarming because that's going to be where the, uh, the radiation comes from mostly. But I could take the derivative of this um, voltage distribution, uh, derivative in X and Y here, and the lower picture here is, is actually the gradient or the derivative with respect to position. And I might see where the, the uh, voltage is changing the fastest here. And so you see these really dark red spots here, there's four of them. That happens to be where the voltage is changing very quickly. And if I was to have an IC in that area, and this IC had many power pins, for example, then uh, um, I might have a power pin in an area, coming back up to the top picture, where I have a relatively low voltage, and also an area where I happen to have relatively high voltage. And so if I've got the power planes inside the IC all connected together, as is typical, then I would end up with uh, uh, potentially circulating currents. At, in this case, 800 megahertz, which would be very bad if your clock frequency was 800 megahertz or some harmonic of that. And so, taking the root of, of um, how fast the voltage is changing with respect to position uh, can be a very useful thing, for example. Now, integration is a, is a little bit more magical when I was in school, it seemed to me anyway, um, but it really, it's not all that bad. And so, we might have um, a single integration symbol which is a line integral. Uh, we might have a surface integral, which is two, a volume integral, which is three. So we look at something like this, and here's a, a relatively simple equation out at the bottom. The voltage is equal to the integration of the electric field across some position. This DL is just a piece of position. So the arrow that you see up here is a, is a the DO. And I'm going to start someplace and stop someplace. And it really doesn't matter where I start and stop. If I want to know what the voltage is from the upper left of this line to the lower right of the line, I could take a straight cut right across there, or I could take this meandering curve that I've shown you. It doesn't matter for this equation. As long as I end and start and stop uh, where I'm supposed to, I'm going to get the same answer. And I'm just going to take the, uh, the electric field along the, this line. And, and multiply it by that piece of position. And if I was to have a number of these lines, of these little arrows, and, they were, and the arrow was small enough so that I would describe all the curves and everything, then I would get the right answer. Now you can see that I was a little lazy in my arrow drawing here and didn't quite describe this curve as well as I should have, but you can imagine making them smaller and smaller and smaller and, and getting to be able to describe that curve better. In fact, the mathematicians will tell us that in the limit, when the length of the arrow, or the DL, is infinitely small, then I'll get the absolute perfect answer. Of course, it always seemed a little bit weird to me that infinitely small sounds an awful like, lot like zero. So I'm going to sum up a bunch of things that are not zero and get an answer that's not zero. But that doesn't seem right. Anyway, I don't have to worry about that. That's what the mathematicians worry about. But from an engineering point of view, when I see a single integration symbol, all I need to know is that I'm going to sum something up, in this case electric fields, along some line. And by the way, notice that this is the definition of voltage down here. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, this, the definition of voltage is really nothing more than the electric field along some path. Uh, I can break this up into pieces and look at just the, uh, the x-directed and the y-directed um, and get the same answer, basically. Now, if I end up with a little circle around the integration symbol here, that means that the, inter the uh, path is closed. So I can start and stop. Suppose I wanted to know what the circumference of this box was. Hopefully, we can do that without having to do an integration, since it's a fairly um, regular structure. But if I wanted to, I could just take an integration, and I could start someplace. I could start down here in the lower left, which is typically what we might do. But I could start also up in the up the middle of the upper uh, line here and go all the way around the, uh, the contour and come up with the same answer because I'm going to start and stop at the same place regardless of where it is. So I'm going to take this and break it up into pieces, the x-directed pieces uh, on the top and the bottom and the y-directed pieces on the left and right. And I'm going to sum up these lengths. And when I'm done, I'll get the circumference around the box. Now again, circumference of a rectangle, I think we can do that without integration. 
But uh, suppose we had something that's a little bit weirder, like this shape here. It's the same kind of concept. I'm going to start and stop anywhere uh, anywhere's on this structure and just sum up a bunch of these little um, pieces to come up with what the, the contour is of this, uh, this odd shape. And it, again, it doesn't matter where I start. Um, anywhere's on there because I'm going to stop wherever this I started and I'm going to end up with the right answer. Okay? So that's a line integral. Now, if I end up with two integration symbols, this can get even more scary because now I got two of them, right? But really, all that means is it's an area. And so, similar to before, where I was looking at a line, now instead of a line, I'm going to take these small little um, cubical areas that I know this is one by one centimeter, inch, whatever you want. And I'm just going to take a bunch of these things and fill up the odd shape that I have here. And as long as my my uh, squares are small enough to describe accurately the, the overall shape that I have. And again, it's not quite perfect here, but you can uh, see if I get smaller and smaller and smaller, I would get the right answer. And so really, when I see a, a two integration symbols, that really just tells me I'm looking at the area of something. Now, if I do a closed contour again, like I did a, a little while ago, we're back to the same sort of thing, where we have uh, an area of some closed surface. A good example of that might be to find the surface area of the Earth, for example. It wouldn't matter whether I started in Raleigh, North Carolina, where the center of the universe is, uh, or Washington, D.C., or wherever you happen to be. Uh, we can start anywhere as we want to and fill up the, uh, the, the surface of the Earth with these small little uh, uh, squares, uh, one by one something, miles or whatever we wanted, and we'll end up with the, uh, the total area of the Earth. Okay, in this example. And then finally, three integration symbols mean we're looking at a volume. And at this point, my PowerPoint um, ability to, uh, to uh, make 3D pictures failed me. But you can still see that if I was to take this cylinder, for example, and I wanted to know what the volume of that cylinder was, I could take small little cubes, one by one by one something, cube, uh, uh, centimeters, inches, or whatever, and when I fill up my volume, whatever it is, my, my object rather, with whatever I, number I need, as long as they're small enough, then I'm going to end up with the right answer. And that'll be the, uh, the total volume of the, uh, of the object. Now, kind of a funny story happened to me some years ago. Um, uh, Dr. Albert Ruley is a friend of mine and probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. And he invented a, a computational electromagnetic um, modeling technique called PEAK the partial element equivalent circuit technique. And I found this I found this very useful over the years. And you know, I'm a little bit off to the side here on, on what this presentation is about. But the point is that when I was looking at the math associated with how this peak technique works, there was six integration symbols. So we've built up from one to two to three. And now I'm talking about six. And so I always try to look at these equations and understand what they mean. Um, you know, and when I look at six integrations, I'm thinking like, well, gee, you know, one is a line, two is an area, three is a volume, four uh, maybe times involved or something, I don't know, and, but six, I'm lost. Well, it turned out by looking at it a little bit more that really what he was doing was he was multiplying uh, two volumes together. And so three of those six integration symbols were for the first um, object and two, the other three rather, were for the second object. And so once I understood that, then it was made a lot of sense. It was just two volumes uh, happened to be multiplied together, and he had chosen to put all six integrations at the beginning of the equation. So the point is not to be um, frightened by these kind of equations and to look beyond them to understand what they mean. Now, to try to use some of these equations to actually calculate things that might be useful to an EMC engineer, well, that's harder. But I don't think that we need to be frightened by the math unless we try to understand what's going on. So let's move down to electromagnetics here from, from simple math. Now, I, you've probably seen pictures some, such as this before. And just as a refresher, as a wave, an electromagnetic wave moves through air or any media, um, we're going to have an electric field variation, which is the, the red arrows. And you can see that uh, at this moment in time that we've, we've frozen things, I've got electric fields that are going positive and negative and then positive again. And I've got magnetic fields that are orientated uh, orthogonal to, to that electric field, 
or 90 degrees off. And then the direction of propagation would be along this, this red axis here in the third direction. And so this is a TEM wave, transverse electromagnetic, meaning that I have electric fields in one direction, magnetic fields in a different direction, and then the, the propagation is in the third orthogonal direction. And you can see here that the wavelength is simply the, uh, the distance uh, here in the electric field or magnetic field is the same thing. Wavelength is just the distance that the wave exists in, in space. So in the beginning, um, in the early days of electromagnetics, the people who were doing the research basically uh, felt that the electric fields and the magnetic fields were not connected. People studied electric fields and other people studied magnetic fields. And they didn't really understand how this all worked. They had something called action at a distance, which was just an excuse to say, I really don't know how this works. But Faraday was the first one to propose the relationship between the electric field and the time varying magnetic fields. And it turns out that Faraday, even though he didn't have a lot of math background, was really good at experiments and designing experiments and then seeing the results of the experiments, figuring out how things actually worked. Maxwell came along and saw the results from Faraday and thought that there was something here. And so he's actually credited with discovering the link uh, between the electric and the magnetic. And I like to say that this is Scotland's greatest contribution to the world next to Scotch. Now, kind of a funny story. I actually um, teach at Oxford University in England every year. I've been doing this now for 13 years or so. And a few years back, I was using this slide, and I mentioned Scotland's greatest contribution to the world next to Scotch. And one of the students raised his hand and said, what's that? And I said, what do you mean, what's that? What's what? And he said, what's Scotch? I said, you don't know what Scotch is? No, he says. And, uh, you know, this guy's like 35 years old. And then I was remembering, we'd gone through the class, and everybody had told me where they were from and what kind of products they worked on and so forth. And I, I, this guy, I said, aren't you from Scotland? And he says, yeah, yeah, and now, his, now he's letting his brogue come out, which I won't even try to repeat. Um, but the, the brogue comes out, and, and he's uh, uh, saying, yeah, yeah, I'm from Scotland, you know, but I don't know what scotch is. And I, I'm looking at him like, I don't know what to say. You know, even if you don't drink, you've kind of heard of scotch. And, you know, and, and so I said, you're from Scotland. You're in your mid-30s, and you never heard of scotch whiskey? Oh, he says, we just call it scotch. I mean, we just call it whiskey, sorry. We just, I ruined my own punchline. Uh, so anyway, I hate it when the students are funnier than I am. Well, anyway, getting back to electromagnetics here, uh, Maxwell is accredited with um, you know, Maxwell's equations, which we all know, hate, and fear. Um, but uh, actually, Maxwell came up with like 22 different equations. It was Heaviside who actually took those equations, rearranged them into the four equations that we're familiar with now. Uh, some of his friends, Heaviside's friends, said you should call these the Heaviside equations, and he was actually modest at this point and said, no, I just rearranged Maxwell's equations, and so we'll leave them at, as Maxwell's equations. Um, and Hertz actually is credited with actually taking the equations into the lab and verifying that they were accurate. So a little bit of uh, electromagnetic history for you all. So I, I think uh, Maxwell's equations are not ter terribly hard. When you look at it, you're, you know, first of all, we've got these del cross H, del cross E kind of symbols. That, that's frightening, but it's really just a derivative. If I was to do this in one dimension, it would be um, I'd be taking the uh, the difference of the magnetic field across a piece of space or the electric field across a piece of space. So just imagine, you know, hold your fingers up, your thumb and forefinger an inch away from each other, and, and say, okay, how fast is the electric field to the magnetic field changing? in between my two fingers. And then that's equal to how fat, um, the electric field changing or the magnetic field changing here. Now the J term is really just the uh, conduction current. So in free space, we have, that's zero. So we'll just ignore that for now. And so on the right-hand side, we've got a change in the electric flux density with respect to time or change in the magnetic flux density with respect to time. And so it kind of makes sense here that the positional change, the spatial change of, electric, of magnetic field on the top equation is equal to the time varying change of the electric field being loose with mu and epsilon, and vice versa down here at the bottom equation, the spatial variation of the electric field is equal to the time variation of the magnetic field. 
By the way, the minus sign that you see in the bottom of the equation is required for uh, wave propagation. And so uh, MIT used to be able to buy a T-shirt that said, on the first day, God put the minus sign in Maxwell's equations. Because according to Genesis, um, in the Bible, on the first day, God created light. And, in order, and light is just electromagnetic energy of very high frequency. In order for you to see it, it has to propagate. And so in order for there to be light that you could see, there had to be wave propagation, hence the minus sign in Maxwell's equations. So another piece of uh, trivia for you. The next time you're talking to your significant other, and uh, you, you might just mention this, and, and he or she will be absolutely convinced that you're a nerd. All right, so this just says in written, written down words what I was talking about here. Then there's other famous equations, of course, Faraday's law. We'll talk about that when we get to the inductance. Uh, Gauss's law and so forth, and you know we can look at any of these equations and break them up just like we did with Maxwell's equations. Solving these equations for something useful might be difficult, but understanding the physics is not so hard. Okay. Now, when we come up to some um, changing media, you know, air to to a dielectric or something, then um, we have to start thinking about how the waves will propagate into this dielectric material or whatever it might be, and we have some some uh, fundamentals here, for example, the tangential electric field on either side of the boundary has to be the same, and the normal flux density of the electric field has to be the same, and so forth with the, the magnetic fields. Um, this just kind of shows a picture. If I had some uh, odd angled electric field, I'd have to break it down into the constitute parts of the tangential and the normal, and then figure out what the fields would be on the other side. Maybe a little bit more interesting is when we have a perfect electrical conductor, uh, the fields inside this conductor must be zero. And in fact, the tangential electric field on the surface of any uh, perfect conductor or any good conductor uh, will be zero. And the way that works is by creating a surface density, a, cur a surface current density, rather. And so uh, uh, basically, I can't have any electric field that's tangential to the PEC boundary here from air, dielectric material, whatever it might be, and so I end up with a current density um, on there to, uh, to to account for that. Now, there's a lot of talk often about near field, far field. Really, the, the, the definition of the far field is that the E and the H field are related by uh, um, 377 ohms. Um, now, that's kind of the perfect case. But you can see that the, uh, if I take the E and the over the H, it's similar to having a resistance, right? And so it's the, the free space uh, impedance. And if I look at the at a curve here, suppose I had a, uh, for example, a dipole antenna. And I'm in very, very close. The x-axis here is in, in wavelengths, uh, distance related to wavelength. And if I'm in very, very close, a dipole antenna is, is an electric field source, very, very little magnetic field. As I get further away, then I, and I get out to about a full wavelength away, then I'm down to this 377 ohm or 120 pi if you're a purist. Um, if I'm in very close and I have a loop antenna, a magnetic field type antenna, the magnetic field antenna, the loop antenna, has a very high magnetic field in close, very, very little electric field. And again, as I get further away, I end up with eventually getting to the point where uh, at a wavelength and I'm at 377 ohms. And you can see that the impedance kind of uh, goes up and down here a little bit in the middle. But if I was to take asymptotes for the electric and magnetic fields here, how they're changing, at about 1 over 2 pi, or 1 sixth of a wavelength, um, is where we would hit that. And so typically for EMC applications, we consider the far field to be at about a sixth of a wavelength. If you want to be really sure, then at a wavelength, then you're de definitely uh, in the far field. But it's not just about the impedance. It's also about the distance. You can imagine, for example, a, um, a Boeing 777 airplane. And I want to do something at, uh, say, 3 gigahertz. I want to make a measurement. Um, at 3 gigahertz, uh, the wavelength is only uh, 10 centimeters. And so that means I could be 10 centimeters away from the airplane and have my uh, 377 ohms relationship between the electric and magnetic field. But obviously, the, uh, the emissions from the nose or the tail or the wings or whatever are going to uh, be very different 
So really what you have to do is step back and be about the same distance away from the aircraft as the size of the aircraft. You're going to be well beyond a wavelength at that point, but now any fields coming from the nose or the tail or whatever will arrive at the same point, and so we can usually um, consider that to be really truly the far field. And so uh, we have to be careful when we look at equations and graphs because a lot of times they're assuming the far field, uh, and, you have, and so you just have to be careful. All right, so <clears throat> now I mentioned I'd come back to this whole thing about voltage, and a good friend of mine years ago told me that there was no such thing as voltage. And this is a real shock to me because I had a voltmeter in the lab, you know. But what he meant was, if you remember Maxwell's equations, there's electric field, there's magnetic field, and there's current. There's no voltage in there. So as a fundamental quantity, there is no such thing as voltage. And in fact, uh, the voltage definition is just simply as shown here, the electric field times this uh, distance over some start to stop point. And so really, as a fundamental quantity, we have to think about current, especially from an EMC point of view, because current radiates, not voltage. And the first thing we learned about current when we were in our first circuits class in the university is that current must always return back to its source. Unfortunately, we kind of forget that, I think, sometimes. And uh, it, it's really a fundamental thing that we have to remember. In fact, when I teach um, EMC design, I tell people that the the uh, number one thing and the number two thing on printed circuit board design that had to do with EMC is all about current and the return current, how the current gets back to its source. And if we were just to control these things and provide good paths back, then uh, there would be no, we wouldn't have anywhere near as many EMC problems. Um, but when we think about voltage, you know, we think about a voltage pulse going from some source IC to some load IC, and nothing ever happens going back, right? But really, it's, it's all about the current. So when we, when we start studying electromagnetics, you know, we learn that uh, they, they talk to us about these electrons maybe in a, in a hose uh, or a pipe or something, and we can kind of think about them, the electrons going down and turning on a light bulb, and, and uh, that's kind of how our early understanding of electricity happens. Um, if we break the, uh, the wire someplace, then the, uh, the, the electrons can't flow back and the light goes off, okay? So very simplistic. But unfortunately, at high frequencies, this is way too simple. In fact, I, I, I like to tell university professors that they really should start teaching with high frequency things and then say, okay, now for DC, this is a special case and it's much simpler and so forth. Of course, DC is much easier to understand and so the professors are not gonna change how they normally do this. Well, then after we learned about DC, we learned about alternating current, like the current in the wall for light bulbs and houses and so forth. And, and uh, it's a sine wave, and in one half of the cycle, current flows in one direction, and then the, it reverses and goes the other for the other half cycle, you know, 60 hertz or 50 hertz or whatever. And that's fine, too. You know, that, that's, that certainly works fine. But uh, again, it doesn't help us with high frequencies and EMC as that we really need to get to be. So let's start thinking now about a printed circuit board. And let's suppose we had a trace with, um, say, 500 picosecond rise time. And if we're using CMOS, which most of us are, um, that means the current actually only comes out of the IC driver during the logic transition when we're going from zero to one. And so we end up with a very short pulse of current. And if we're going over some distance, say a few inches like a, my example here, then that current is going to exist only over a small piece of that trace, not along the whole thing. So it's not like the current comes out of the IC, all the, you know, a single electron goes all the way down to the load, maybe 12 inches away or something, and then returns back in the ground plane back to the IC. That's too simplistic. We actually are going to end up with a pulse of current. And so one way to think about this might be to think about a tank tread. As this tank moves forward, the uh, the tread on the up the upper tread is moving in the same direction as travel, but the tread on the bottom is moving backwards. And at the ends here, we've got the tread coming around uh, and, and closing. So we have the tread is 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 closed, if you will, but it's still maintaining a loop here. So here's a good example with a simulation of the current. And you can kind of see that the current is uh, uh, a little bit jumpy here with this web thing. 
for some reason. Let me back up one. Okay, this looks a little smoother. So you can see there's a a pulse of current. The, uh, the yellow and the red are where the current density is highest, and you can see that it doesn't exist over the entire trace. It's just existing over a small part of the trace. Uh, and, and so in the ground plane underneath, the current will be, like the tank tread, will be going in the opposite direction. Now, if we look at a side view of a print circuit board trace, here I've got a trace on this upper line. Here's a trace in the ground reference plane on the bottom here. And I'm showing you the, this tank tread kind of current. You can see on the bottom of the trace, the current is going in the direction of propagation. The return current in the, uh, in the ground plane is going in the opposite direction. And then I have this displacement current, this dashed line to, of the uh, basically capacitance between the trace and the ground plane where the current comes down and actually the, the, uh, the dashed lines on the left here are in the wrong direction, unfortunately, sorry. Uh, but you can see that they, they would travel down as a packet of current through the, um, on the trace. So this is what actually is happening when we're, when we're sending pulses of current down the line. And of course, there'd be multiple ones. I'm only showing one here, but there could be multiple ones depending on the, uh, the actual data that we're trying to send. Okay, now another thing to keep in mind is skid effect. And uh, basically, the current is only going to flow on the surface of the, uh, of the metal uh, at high frequencies. You know, when we, when we first study a circuits class, we know that, uh, you know, if I had a, uh, a wire with a particular diameter and so forth, that as long as I know what the um, diameter of the wire is, uh, the area really of the cross section of the wire, and what the total current is, and I know what the current density is because the current is constant throughout that cross sectional area. But at high frequencies, that doesn't happen. At high frequencies, the current gets closer and closer and closer to the surface and ultimately is only really on the surface. And you can see here, uh, here's the equation for the skin effect depth. Um, this is a really uh, complicated equation. Pi is a constant. Mu is pretty much a constant. And even sigma, you know, for copper is going to be a constant or, you know, change maybe depending on what kind of metal you have. But overall, it's basically that the square root of the frequency is going to control how far into the uh, metal current goes. And so we can see here that um, by the time I get up to, say, 10 megahertz, the skin depth is only uh, less than one mil thick. By the time you get to 100 megahertz, it's a quarter of a mil thick. So you can imagine that if I had a, uh, uh, a ground plane, for example, and it was a one ounce copper, which is basically a little bit more than one mil thick, uh, and I wanted to lower the resistance of that copper by making it thicker, maybe going to two ounce copper, where it'd be about two mil thick, well, it really doesn't matter because the current is only going to be about a quarter of a mil into the metal anyway. So however much metal I have there, it really doesn't matter. And you can see by the time I get to a gigahertz, it's even less than a tenth of a mil. So all the current's really on the surface. So just to kind of show you this, if this was a trace, for example, coming out of the board at you, at very low frequencies, the current is everywhere in this cross-section of the trace. As they go higher in frequency, the current tends to migrate just to the outer edges, and I end up with only current around the edge here. And so that's kind of an example of skin effect at high frequencies. So at high frequencies, uh, I'm going to have resistive loss and dielectric loss, but usually inductance is going to dominate. And I think inductance is probably one of the most misunderstood things in electrical engineering. You know, they talk to us in school about inductors that I can hold in my hand and I understand about how the impedance of an inductor increases with frequency and so forth. But inductance is uh, uh, something that they often don't really talk about. So as soon as we have current flowing through metal, I'm going to have inductance. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's just a fundamental thing. And I'm always going to have current flow because no matter what I'm doing, I'm trying to send information from one point on my circuit board to another point on my circuit board. And even if I think about voltage pulses, we see that it's really about the current, not about the voltage. And inductance is really just a fundamental in, element in everything. And you know, we often forget that the loop area is what really um, defines how much inductance we're going to have. And of course, again, the reason that we care is that inductance is going to, uh, the impedance of the inductance is going to increase as um, frequency and the amount of inductance we have. 
And the bottom line is that current is always going to get back to its source. It has to get back. It will get back. It must get back. And it, the only question is, do you feel lucky today? Because if you feel lucky, then maybe the current will go in some path that is uh, uh, not harmful to you. However, if it finds that the path of least impedance is some other path other than what you thought it was going to take, then uh, that ca could cause EMC problems. <clears throat> Why isn't this moving now? Okay, so oh, my, my computer's acting funny here. I'm sorry. Okay, so the fundamental definition of inductance is given by Faraday's law. And so here's Faraday's law right here. And uh, uh, you can see that it's, it's basically showing that um, the, uh, the electric field times the distance integrated over a closed loop. Oh, gee, that's the voltage, right? The voltage around the loop. And then the, uh, that's equal to two integration symbols. Well, that's an area. And that's just the area, uh, how much of the magnetic flux density that's changing with respect to time is going through that area. So I can simplify this equation to um, the lower one. And, uh, oops, sorry. I can simplify the equation to the lower one here. And, and basically what I'm seeing is that uh, the voltage on the left-hand side of this loop area, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I'm sorry, my, my computer is just acting up here, or WebExes or something. Um, the, the loop area is shown on the, on the lower left. Steve, are you still there? Yes, your screen is, uh, looks like it's faded, Bruce. It's uh, present, but it looks like it's kind of, you know, uh, not a good contrast. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Are you able to hear me? Steve? Yes, I'm here, Bruce. Are you able to hear me, Bruce? To the audience, let me apologize. We need to get Bruce uh, back here. It looks like he's dropped a connection. I uh, see that he's faded. Let us hang on and watch the screen come back for just a moment. Bruce, your microphone and video is back now. Bruce, are you able to hear us? You're on. Everybody there? Yes, Bruce, we're here. Are you able to hear us? Bruce, you are, a, are coming through. Bruce, are you now hearing us? <laughs> Christina, can you unmute and say something? Hi, Bruce, are you still with us? I don't know if anybody's still hearing me, but for some reason my computer is just gone blank. You are I'm not present. sure whether it's because I'm sharing screen or not. We see your picture, Bruce. Um, yeah, I guess you can't hear us. I'm going to take the ball and give it back to Bruce. Bruce. 
Bruce, are you able to hear us now? Take the presentation and then give it back to you. Okay. Uh, for those in the audience, please bear with us while we work out the technical difficulty. Bruce, I think you need to log back in. You just disappeared. You got disconnected somehow. Yeah, I can hear you on my cell phone. I can also hear you on the um, WebEx meeting. But, uh, okay. All right, my system seems to be, my computer seems to be hung up here. I can't seem to do anything. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about this. For attendees, we are working on the technical lift currently. Please hang on. We will be back on as soon as possible. I'm still working on Steve. I'm trying not to reboot. My system seems to be coming back, but it's coming back slowly, so I don't know what in the world happened. Yeah, well, I did an office upgrade yesterday. I had to, then uh, it was working just fine. Okay, and, your audio was back on for the headset. All right, that's a positive sign. My screen is still mostly blank here. 
And Bruce, I have your audience out in the air at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I'm. My system is still not working properly here. Just uh, it, it seems to be coming back, but I'm. This doesn't do something here soon. I'm going to have to reboot. I'm still here, and it's still thinking. It's um, it's bringing back the um, the, the WebEx event um, screen slowly here. Trying to kill the um, the WebEx event through Task Manager. Let me get back to my, see if I get my system back. Sounds to me sounds to me like uh, you might want to reboot. Give it another couple of minutes, but um, it sounds to me like you will need to reboot your machine. You think so? Let's give it another two minutes. Yeah, just let me. Probably a five minute break here when, and then he'll come back in, huh? Yeah, I'm going to reboot. Sounds good. We'll be here.
to attendees. Bruce is restarting his computer. It was unable to get it reconnected. We will be with you shortly.
Bruce is logging back into the WebEx at this point. It should be back on within a couple of minutes.
Yep. Can you hear me now? Okay. All right. Hi, Bruce, you're right here. Okay. Okay, I'm going to just nip so. Welcome back, Bruce. Um, while you get your presentation ready to go, I'm going to hand the uh, tool back to you. And you should be able to resume your presentation anytime you're ready. All right, just give me almost there. Okay. I want to thank all of the attendees for being patient. Uh, all the attendees remained with us. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I apologize to everybody about this. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Your screen is visible. All right. You're there, and you are here. I saw 42. Only, only 15 minutes later. Wow, technology is such a wonderful thing. Okay, so anyway, sorry everyone. Um, so I, I think I mentioned this slide already that uh, you know inductance is a fundamental element in everything, and uh, and the bottom line is that a current is going to find the path of least impedance. At low frequencies, path of least impedance means the least resistance, but at high frequencies, it means it's the uh, path of least inductance. Okay, so Faraday's law is the, um, the fundamental definition of inductance here. On the left-hand side, we see that we have uh, the integration of the electric field times a, a distance, and this is the voltage, as you recall. The, uh, the little loop here means a voltage around the loop. And so we can come down to this picture here, and we can say, okay, I'm going to take the voltage around this loop of conductor, which is really the same as the voltage in this little gap here. On the right-hand side of the equations, I've got two integration symbols, which means it's an area. And really, it's simply the area, uh, or try, try to sum up, rather, the total uh, amount of magnetic flux density changing with respect to time in that area. Now, if the loop is small, so that the amount of uh, the, the flux density is a constant in the loop, I can pull it out, and I can just create this lower equation here, where the voltage is equal to the area times the amount of time-varying magnetic field. So now come back to this picture. If I was to put a current into the top wire, they're around, so it's going to go around clockwise, then, and this current is time-varying, then the magnetic field flux density here is going to be time-varying. And of course, as soon as I have a loop of current, I'm, I will end up with this flux density. So as soon as I have this flux density, this time-varying flux density through some area, like here on the equation on the right shows, I'm going to end up with this voltage. And you notice a minus sign here. Basically, this voltage is a voltage that is created to, to try to stop the amount of current that I'm trying to drive into this, into this loop. So it's an impedance or uh, a resistance, if you will, uh, trying to impede the amount of current I'm putting in there. And, and you'll notice there here on the, both sides of Faraday's law, there's a loop. The little uh, circle on the integration symbol is showing that we have a loop. And the fact that we have an area on the right uh, means that we have to have a closed circumference. You can't have an area if you don't have a closed circumference. So there's a loop around the circumference. So both sides of Faraday's law is showing us that we have to have a loop in order for this inductance to happen. Okay. So given this definition of inductance, does this ground strap have inductance, or even a surface mount capacitor, or even a via? And really, the answer is no. You know, if someone says that I'm going to use a, a ground strap because it has low inductance, you really should smack them upside the head because until you know where the current is going and, and whether or not the um, uh, how how the loop has changed of the current, you can't say anything about whether or not the uh, the loop has inductance. Even a surface mount capacitor, you know, the vendors will tell you that it has an equivalent amount of uh, series inductance, ESL. 
But really what they do when they measure that is they actually create a small loop, and the loop is as small as it possibly can get, where they put a voltage across the uh, capacitor and, and uh, measure the current through it. And of course, as soon as I measure current, that means I have to have a loop. And they make that loop as small as possible, so the loop area is as small as possible, and therefore they have as low inductance as they possibly can get. Of course, once we put this onto a printed circuit board, all bets are off, and the loop area is much, much larger. And so that ESL is a, uh, a best case that can never be achieved kind of inductance for that capacitor. So I doubt there's many people who live here in the U.S. that haven't seen the Lord of the Rings movies. And, you know, we had these uh, this evil ring of power, right, that uh, had all this weird writing on it. And supposedly it was one ring to bring them all in darkness, bind them and all that. I think it really what it meant was that um, this loop will cause inductance, and that will be the fundamental evil for all printed circuit boards. So the next time you're watching one of these movies, you can uh, mention that to your significant other, and uh, then they'll be really, really sure that you're a nerd. Now, there's a few equations here that we can go through uh, to look at what the inductance is. Um, a simple circular loop here is the upper equation, and you see that we have this A here, this A term, outside of the, the log function as well as inside the log function, that A is the loop area. And the R0 is the conductor uh, radius. So if I want to make my conductors larger, then I can lower the inductance by, you know, if I double the, the amount of, of wire radius, uh, my the inductance goes down by one over, uh, by the rather the natural log of one over two. Uh, however, if I have the uh, area, you can see that I get a 1 over 2 factor right out here right away, as well as I get another multiplier here of the, uh, the log function uh, of the area. So the change in the area of the loop is going to change the amount of inductance very, very quickly, uh, much faster than changing the, the wire size. Actually, it's not the wire size so much as the current density, but uh, it's, here it's just shown as a wire size. And if I had a rectangular loop, I have a more complicated, complicated formula, but the um, Still, the area of the loop is outside the log function. Inside the log function, we have this P term, which is the wire radius. Um, if we look at mutual inductance, then I can have um, two loops. And basically, if I drive a current in one loop, the, I look to see how much flux density is in the second loop, and that's the mutual inductance. So you can see this formula here. The mutual inductance is equal to the amount of flux in loop two given some amount of current in loop one. If I was to um, make the uh, loop smaller, loop two smaller, for example, or move it further away, then the amount of current, I'm sorry, the amount of flux going through that second loop would be less, and so my amount of mutual inductance would be down. Here I've got two loops of wire. Loop one is I'm driving, and uh, I'm just taking a, a cut through the middle here to look at the magnetic fields. And, and so you can kind of see here that uh, the magnetic fields are very, very strong uh, in this area of the loop, as well as way over here on the left, which is this area of the loop, because that's where the wire is going through this cut view plane. And you can see, of course, in the loop, you can see the magnetic fields are pretty strong. If we go away from the, the loop, whether it's on the left or the right, you can see the magnetic fields are changing very quickly and going down smaller. So the, you can see that if I was to move this second loop further away and maybe start about halfway out where it is right now, there'd be very little um, magnetic field going through that second loop, therefore the mutual inductance would be less. And if I zoom in, we can kind of see the same, same effect here. And this is the same thing, just showing colors instead of arrows. But really, if we look at how fast the mutual inductance changes as we change the distance between the two loops, you can see that the magnetic field falls off very, very quickly as we get further away. So mutual inductance goes down. And as I mentioned, if I make one of the loops smaller or even turn them so that they're 90 degrees um, orthogonal to each other, then uh, just by making it smaller, the amount of flux in the loop is smaller, so the mutual inductance is down. If I turn them so they're 90 degrees, like the lower picture showing, then none of that flux density is going through the loop, and so there's effectively no mutual inductance. Now, there's a term called partial inductance that a lot of people are confused about. But it's really not that complicated. We know that in order to have inductance, we have to have a loop. Okay, well, at least we know that now. Um, and we know that we have to have a complete loop to have inductance. 
But where would we put that inductance in a circuit? If I was to take a print circuit board circuit like this, I've got some power supply here, up here, and then an IC. And when the IC is, is going from 0 to 1, the uh, switch actually, you can think of it as a switch that closes so the current comes down through the power supply out onto the trace. And then if I have a CMOS device, it goes through the, uh, uh, the, the load back through the ground, back to some power supply, decoupling capacitors, or whatever. So if I put the inductance up here in the power plane, well, that's fine, but that doesn't take into account the conductor size is very different down here in the, uh, in the trace. If I put it there, then that's not taking into account the fact that I've got some current through the ground plane here, and it's going to go through some distance, and that's going to have some, some voltage drop across there. If I put it down there, then I'm, you know, I can put it all over the place, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I have to really put pieces of the inductance in all these places so that I can have the right amount of inductance, because in the real world, we're never going to have a, a simple situation where the, uh, uh, where the current is, is going through conductors that are the same size. So hence the, the, the partial inductance idea. And so here what we're doing is we're basically taking um, the total loop here. I've got a simple loop, and I'm just putting this partial inductance in each one of the legs of this loop. And I'm going to sum each of these partial inductances up to find this total inductance. But I also have to include the mutual inductances. And so here I'm showing that I've got a mutual inductance between the parallel legs 2 and 4, and a partial mutual inductance between the parallel legs 1 and 3. And so I, I subtract those two off. And now I've got the loop area involved because the distance between them are involved in this in these mutual inductances. And the individual wire sizes can be conducted, uh, calculated rather, from uh, for each of these partial inductances. So now I can take into account the fact that trace is a different size than a ground plane, which is a different size than the power plane, probably, and, and so forth. You notice that if I was to um, want to lower the total inductance here, I could increase the conductor size, because this LP1, for example, is just calculated based on the length of the conductor and the cross-section. Um, very simple. So if I was to make the cross-section larger, I would lower that partial inductance. But you can also see that if I was to bring legs 1 and 3 closer together, I would increase the partial mutual inductance 1 to 3. And I'm subtracting off in this equation the partial mutual inductance, two times the partial mutual inductance, actually. And so by bringing those conductors together, making the loop area smaller, effectively, I've lowered the total inductance much faster by changing the mutual inductance, that is the loop area, uh, than by, by uh, changing the conductor size, just as we were talking about before. So when someone tells you that uh, I have a ground strap that has low inductance or I have a capacitor with an ESL of some, such and such, you can turn to them and with a kind of knowing smile say, oh, you must mean the partial inductance of that ground strap, right? And most people that really don't know much about partial inductance are going to probably, it's probably going to serve two things. First, they're going to think you're really smart, which you are because you know about partial inductance. And second, they'll probably leave you alone because they're going to be afraid that you're going to show them to be an idiot. And so both things are probably a, a positive thing, right? And so you know, we can do the same sort of thing with partial inductance, um, you know, something that looks more like a circuit board here where I had a uh, couple of vias and a, a trace and a ground plane. And it's the same sort of thing. The partial inductances add and the partial mutual inductances subtract. And if I was, for example, to bring uh, the two vias closer together, the loop area gets smaller. The partial mutual inductance between the two vias, one to three increases, and so as I decrease a larger, negative, a larger number, I've lowered the total inductance. So the important thing about inductance, I think, is that inductance is everywhere. The loop area is the most important, and you can't get away from it. It's, it's a fundamental quantity. If you have current flowing on your circuit boards or your systems, there will be inductance. And, and the, uh, the bottom line is that the current will find the path of least impedance. And at high frequencies, which is usually anything above a few megahertz, that's going to be the path of least inductance. Um, I mentioned decoupling capacitors, and you can see this loop area here, the capacitor mounted on a circuit board is much, much larger than what the ESL would be if you had the ground plane right underneath the, uh, the capacitor. And so while the circuit boards aren't that thick, effectively it is thick on the dimensions that we're dealing with, and it actually adds quite a bit of inductance to a capacitor. 
And so, you know, when we think about uh, decoupling capacitors and we think about how we're going to mount them on the circuit board, uh, we might have a case of the, um, the, 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 the via in the pad of the uh, capacitor, although most manufacturing um, people don't do that because they're afraid of the, uh, the solder from the capacitor wicking down into the hole of the via. And so we might end up with a little bit of trace or even a lot of trace. I actually saw a case once where there was like eight inches of trace between a capacitor pad and a, a via. And I went back to the designer and said, what in the world are you doing? And, and he said, well, I wanted to put a capacitor over by this, this connector here, but there was no room. So I put the uh, capacitor about eight inches away where there's plenty of space and uh, just ran a trace over to the uh, connector area. I said, well, I think you can no populate that capacitor. It's not going to do you any good. But when we talk about capacitance, I think, you know, we talked about inductance. I think it's also useful to think about what is the definition of capacitance. Capacitance is really just the amount of charge stored for a given voltage. And so when we think about capacitors, and we have another talk coming up in this series where we talk about decoupling a lot, but when we think about capacitance, really a capacitor is nothing more than a bucket of charge, a bucket of electrons that's stored there. And so the, the definition of capacitance doesn't have anything to do with frequency. People talk about high frequency capacitors and low frequency capacitors, but it's really um, a misunderstanding. It's really just a place to store charge. The amount of inductance associated with a capacitor when the physical size of the capacitor changes can change the, um, the, how fast the inductance, I mean, how fast the charge can get out of a capacitor. So when we think about high frequency capacitors and low frequency capacitors, we have to kind of think of where this came from. And uh, I'm old enough to remember vacuum tube technology. Um, I think Steve might remember some of that as well. Um, and in vacuum tube technology, you know, the frequencies weren't terribly high. And we would have these capacitors that were relatively large. And they had many, many microfarads in them, maybe even a 1,000 microfarads or something. But they would be a can that would be maybe an inch in diameter, maybe a few inches high. And, and they worked fine. They stored lots of electrons. Well, as we went higher and higher in frequency, all of a sudden, um, maybe up to 10 megahertz or so, all of a sudden, the inductance associated with the physical size of those capacitors was such that we couldn't get the charge out fast enough to do what we needed to do at 10 megahertz. And so they came up with these little disk capacitors, I'll show them here on the right, and these are about the size of a thumbnail or a little fingernail. And they didn't have, back in those days, they didn't have a lot of capacitance. You know, you might end up with uh, 1,000 picofarads or maybe even maybe 10,000 picofarads, but that was about it. And, and so you couldn't get a lot of charge, but you could get really close. And, when you, and the physical size was so small that you could get the charge out very fast because the inductance was so low. And so you put a very large capacitor and a physically small capacitor in parallel with each other, um, and the, high, the, uh, the small, physically small capacitor would serve for the high-frequency content, and the physically large capacitor would serve for the lower frequency content. And, and somehow where along the line, we started thinking that small values of capacitance were for high frequency and large values of capacitance was for low frequencies. But really, it's all about the physical size. And when we go to a surface mount capacitor, we can get many, many different values of capacitance in the same physical size. And if a capacitor is nothing more than a charge storage device, a bucket of electrons, for example, then we can uh, think that what we really want is as many electrons as possible stored, that is a larger value of capacitance, in, in as small a package as we can get, and then we get it out, charge out faster. You know, when I was in school, they told me that uh, a, as, uh, as frequency increased, the, the impedance of a capacitor would decrease. And you can see that, you know, in these lines here, I just took a simple spreadsheet and, uh, you know, calculated what the impedance was of a capacitor. And at low frequencies, the value of the capacitor makes a big difference in what the impedance is. But once we go through the self-resonance, where the impedance of the capacitance is equal to the impedance of the inductance of the capacitor, you see we're on the same line here. It's all the same amount of inductance. And so, um, really, the uh, capacitors are only effective at low frequencies, and after they go through their self-residence, they become inductors. Now, just for reference purposes here, we got a uh, typical capacitor size. Um, most designers would tell me that they want to have about 10 mils of spacing between the capacitor pad and the via, so make sure that they don't get the, the solder on the capacitor pad going down the via hole. 
And so I calculated out for a couple different values, size of capacitor, first 0603, 042, 0805. And you can see here that the um, amount of inductance as we go deeper into the planes uh, is, is significant. Now, typically for 0603, 0805, the equivalent series inductance is probably less than a half a nanohenry. But you can very quickly see that even if I'm only going a little ways into the printed circuit board to my power ground plane pair, I'm adding uh, one and a half to two to three even nanohenries of inductance. And so that equivalent series inductance is, again, an unreasonable um, low end here. And if we add another 50 mils to it, you can see that the amount of inductance goes up. And I don't expect you to remember these numbers, and, and I know that the uh, slides will be available, so you can have these as a kind of a reference to put up on your wall if you want to. So the bottom line here is that I think that electromagnetics is not really hard uh, after we get past the mess, messy math. Uh, university professors ought to be able to calculate something that you can uh, um, be graded on and stuff. They have to deal with the mathematics. Um, but I think that understanding what the basic equations mean is important and is going to help design printed circuit boards and design systems uh, much more effectively. Remember that the current is what's important. There is no such thing as voltage. It's a, it's a man-made construct. Of course, it's a lot more convenient to measure voltage than it is to measure current, but still the bottom line is that uh, current is the thing that's happening on our circuit boards and our systems that actually causes um, anything to happen. I'm very fond of saying that ground is a place for potatoes and carrots, and if you were in the last talk we gave, um, you heard that again, and I always refer back to that because um, the return path in our circuit boards, we call it a ground plane, but really it's a return current path, and uh, it doesn't matter whether it's called ground or called 5 volts or called Detroit or called apples or whatever, the amount of current coming back is going to be, um, it's going to be on whatever is going to give me the lowest inductance. And as I said earlier, that return current flow is the number one cause of EMC problems in printed circuit boards. And so designing that path intentionally is going to help you make sure that uh, um, you have an effective design. Okay, and that's the, uh, that's the end of this talk. And I apologize for the delay and the extra long time here. I appreciate you hanging in there with me to uh, get to the end. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate your efforts in getting this restored. I did have a question come up <clears throat> on your slide 46. You talk about the loop area calculation, but you did not have units of measurement for the area for those equations. Oh, okay. Uh... This one, yeah. That one, with the yeah. A. Yeah, this is in. Um, it's going to be in metric. Um, basically, if you were to think about the units of mu, and make sure that the um, the units, of course, here, um, the units are going to uh, need to be in the same here. But out here, as long as we, you know, mu is usually using metric units, and so as long as we use the same metric units here for the area, we'll, we'll end up with. Uh, uh, the correct answer. Okay. And uh, slide 36, where the tank tread the example was being shown. Yep. <coughs> Sorry, trying to, uh, trying to get okay. back there. Here we go. Your screen okay. isn't being visible right now. What was the question? Uh, the the uh, example showed this moving tank tread along the two lines, but it, it didn't. Yeah. Uh, they they didn't expand the or elongate the tank tread as the pulse moved. Would that be the case, or would it be continuously moving on the return and keeping that area, shall we say? It's going to keep that same area. Okay. Um, yeah, for some reason, I, I'm not sharing anymore. Let me see if I can get back to sharing. There you go. Okay. It's coming in. Yeah, so, you know, the, the current of the, the current pulse 
you know, similar to the tank tread, it's just going to keep that same loop area as it goes down the trace. In fact, the uh, I believe it's either the one before or the one after slide. The one, one after the that one, right? As you move that along, it's indicating that it stays the same. So right. the return is being fed back through the field. Right. Okay. Good. And you mentioned something about far field and the size of the antenna. You indicated the aircraft being, you need to consider the size. Can you expand on that? Yeah, basically um, the uh, the idea is that the, uh, the, the fields that are coming to the receive antenna from this source, whatever that source is, need to arrive from all points on that source at the same time. So the, the source needs, you know, for the for the concept of a far field, the source needs to be, um, you know, theoretically at least a point source. Now, you know, in practice, a point source would mean for an aircraft you'd have to be, you know, a mile away or something. That's impractical. But if you get to be about the same distance away as the size of the object, then fields from the nose or the tail or the or the middle of the plane would arrive at the receive antenna about the same time, and so that would be uh, that. Then you could consider yourself being in the far field. Again, presuming that you have the relationship between E and H, B at 377 ohms. Uh, so. Okay. Okay. That provided a little bit more. I don't see any other questions arriving. Let me do a quick check. No, none there or none there. I do want to thank you very much for your presentation. And I'm going to take this out and do a little bit of closeout summary, Bruce. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing because I'm changing the presenter. And we do have some upcoming things with Bruce uh, continuing, and we're going to resolve the technical problems for the future, I hope. April has a couple of uh, webinars, PC board power distribution optimization, controlling common mode noise at high-speed circuits. And in June, he follows up with electromagnetic uh, features of electromagnetic band gap structures and effective materials for high-frequency EMC design. I hope to see everyone come in uh, later with that. And I do believe I have a question here. Just bear with me. Um, do, yes, I do. Bear with me. Um, I think it's just a, an old comment that I failed to recognize earlier. Uh, I, again, thanks, Bruce, for your item. And for uh, just General Academy, Washington Labs has several ways to get uh, things. This six-pack was one of those, but we offer uh, webinars on a variety of topics in multiple part series or individual items. And these webinars are available to buy a multi-part or a subscription. And you can mix and match webinars. You don't have to do uh, six of, of any one thing, you can do four of one and two of another one to accommodate your six-pack registration. Unless there are additional questions coming in, I want to thank Bruce again for being here, and I will conclude this webinar. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.